All right, hello, I'm current SSB president, Brian O'Mara. I'm here to introduce Laura Kubako. Um, but first, some more about SSB. So we have some symposia happening, evolution. Um, one is happening today here at 9.30. Um, how do you make decisions about data analyses and systematic biology? We have one tomorrow on towards the network of life, project networks as a tool to understand complex evolutionary histories. That's tomorrow right across the hall. So please come to those. We also have another talk of interest, which is done by the various societies' diversity committees, um, progress and shortcomings in pursuing inclusivity and in EEB within the tri-societies. That's also today at 9.30 over in room 19. So that promises to be a very important talk for us to see. We had the Ernst Meyer Symposium. Um, it was a hybrid one this year. We had some, some talks online and some talks in person. And these are some of the best talks in systematics. Right? These, are, these are amazing, amazing new students who are presenting um, and here's a list of who presented. Um, if you missed those talks, uh, you can still watch them for the next six months online on the streaming platform. So these are cool movers and shakers in our field. Go see what they're doing. And we can announce the winners. So Dylan DeBon and Mark Hibbins were the, our two Myra winners this year. So congratulations to them. We also sponsored workshops at Evolution this year, um, one on Philo Gator and one on Rev Bays. Um, if you have ideas for future workshops, let us know. Um, we always have very happy to sponsor workshops. We have a satellite meeting coming up. So in Mexico City in January 2023, we have a satellite meeting for two days. There's also a workshop associated with it. Um, I've seen a lot of meetings being planned. This is among the most impressively planned meetings I've seen so far. It's like they have a great team working on it, led by Susana Magillon. Um, stay tuned for more information on it, but it looks like it'll be like a beautiful meeting. So please come. We have two journals. So our original journal, Systematic Biology, um, our editor-in-chief, Brian Carstens, is rotating out. We have a new editor-in-chief, Isabella St. Martin. Um, this journal publishes Cutting Edge Science and Systematics. Um, it's number three journal by Impact Factor, for those that matters, but still shows like our importance of the journal. Um, and it's hybrid, so it's open access if you pay, and it's cheaper for, me for members. We also have a new journal, The Bulletin of the Society of Systematic Biologists. It's started by Brian Carstens. It's done in collaboration with the Ohio State University Libraries. We've had two issues published so far, and it is very, very open, right? So it's free to read, like all open access things, but it's also free to, for any, any SSB member to publish, right? Which is a very dumb idea to make money, but it's a brilliant idea for getting science out. So we're very, very proud of this. Um, this is the, that's the forever plan. This is an intro price. This is what we're gonna do forever with this. So if you have good articles, please submit them to the bulletin. Um, it covers everything from monographs to multi-species genomic analyses to teaching virtual phylogenetic workshops. So a huge range of areas. We have issues coming up on reticulate evolution, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and species delimitation. If you have ideas for other things, please let us know. Um, awards, we give out a lot of money. So 115,000 in graduate student research awards this year, and almost $60,000 in mini arts grants. So we, uh, we'll be having a call soon for more awards. Um, please apply, please have students apply that you know. We also have ad hoc funding. So you have some, see some need in systematics, biology, diversity, that you think needs, needs money to work on? Let us know, we actually have money. Um, we want to help you know, promote the field in various ways. So reach out to us, please. Um, finally, the IDEA Award. So inclusiveness, diversity, equity, um, and uh, access in evolution biology. So this is more given by all three societies together, right? And so we have hundreds of people in our societies working on these issues because they're really important. And out of all those people, we have to choose one group per year. And so last year was Adriana Briscoe, who's giving a talk here tomorrow in 24 hours. So please come to her talk. And then this year's awardees, uh, Sukinta Arif and Melanie Dukbo Masi, um, who created the Diversity of Nature group, right? Whose mission is to help bring in more, more people who are black, indigenous, or people of color into our field. Um, and so it started last year, and it's a really great group, and it's really happy for them to get the award. And finally, is today's speaker. So Laura Kubako, maybe you know from her work. So one thing you see in a lot of the talks this year is how you know, genetic networks, reticulation, things like that are really hot areas where things are slowly catching up to her. She was doing this years and years ago, right? She hasn't stopped, slowed down since. Um, she's also president of our society at a time of peak COVID, so lots of people having personal and professional hits, and yet she still led us really well. Um, one thing in both her research and her, and her leadership 
is picking out like small bits of information, whether it's quartets of trees or small groups of people, and making them work together to find a great, great unified whole. And so she's really a leader in our field, leader, leader of people. I'm very proud to introduce her. So Laura Kubako. All right, good morning. Um, thank you very much to Brian for the nice introduction, and thank you to all of you for getting up early on the, I guess, third full day of a pretty intense um, conference and, and making your way here to hear the talk today, and, and thank you to those who are joining us online. Um, the title of my talk is Embracing Variability, and um, so what we're gonna do today is sort of explore perceptions of how people think about variability in general, and then talk about it specifically in the context of the area in which I work, which is species tree estimation. And before we dive into the slides, um, I just want to point out that the illustrations in this talk have been prepared by Sydney Decker, who is a wonderful graduate student in the Karstens lab. So if you enjoy looking at the slides, that's all to Sydney's credit and not mine. Um, OK, so let's get into things here. OK, so the first question as I was thinking about this talk was, you know, how do people think about variability? So when I say the word variance or I say the word variability, what do you think? So this is a scientific audience, so I think you probably come up with some pretty healthy definitions of variability. But it's interesting to sort of explore what we mean by that. So take a minute and think about if I ask you for a definition of variability, um, what you would say, okay? Um, and then I started thinking, okay, maybe people have done some research on this. Maybe there's some things that are known about how people think about variability. So I started Googling a little bit and then you, um, can find some things. And actually, this article is a 2021 article, so relatively recent. And in the article, they make the case that people really haven't studied very much how people think about variability. So they do a little bit of that work um, in this article. And one of the tasks that they do is they ask people, I've got the, my cheat sheet here, they give people a free association task where they ask people to think of the five words that are strongly associated with the term variance. And what you see on the slide is then this um, network linking words that appear together, okay? Um, if we sort of get some, some summaries of that, the word difference was picked by 48% of the people responding in this task. So variability or variance and difference seem to be associated with one another. Deviation, probably because of standard deviation and maybe a little bit of statistical background in the audience is also associated with this term variance. Um, variety, which possibly has a more positive connotation than some of those other terms, was only mentioned by 13% of people. So it's sort of interesting, and it, it you know, made me wonder, as I was talking to some of the students in my group, um, some people thought maybe variance or variability has sort of a negative connotation for people, like, people, like things that vary too much, unusual events like maybe getting an illness are viewed negatively, and that variance is not such a good thing. And it's sort of interesting that some of these words deviation seem to be a little more negative than others, variety. So, so how do people think about this? Okay, but we're not, we're not, we're a specific collection of people, so how do biologists think about the word variability? And I think here there are both um, positive and negative um, ways to think about it in a biological context. So we might think about biodiversity when we think about variability, or we might think about genetic diversity. So we might think that a lot of variance, um, genetic variance, or variance in morphology or behavior or a type of environment used are all very positive things. So there's a component of variance that seems very positive for biologists. There's also variance that we might not be so excited about. So suppose that we do this experiment and we collect these samples and we get these four replicates. It looks like replicates one, two, and three tell a pretty consistent, nice story. Um, or sorry, one, two, and four tell a pretty consistent and nice story. Um, replicate three looks a little uh, less consistent and maybe challenges us to think of a slightly different biological story. So variation in replicates might not be such a um, positive thing to observe. Or similarly, an experiment in the lab where, you know, the first four repetitions come out a certain way and then, oh, repetition number five, now I've got to rethink things. So, um, so it's interesting that, you know, in some cases we might welcome variability, in some cases we might think, oh, this has just created more work for me. 
Um, then I asked how do statisticians think about variance. This, I'm trained as a statistician. I don't know if Brian mentioned this. And my primary appointment is in a statistics department. Um, and I think we're pretty clear about how we think about variability. We would like there to be less variability. So um, we spend a lot of time talking about the concept of minimum variance on biased estimation. Um, and I um, looked up the, the, you know, just a quick definition of that on Wikipedia. And um, you can see that, let me try out the pointer here. This is the pointer. OK. And we can see that um, it's important to find this minimum variance on biased estimators so that less than optimal procedures can be avoided. So we definitely want to minimize variance. Um, another place that it often comes up in a statistical concept is a, co a context is um, when we're thinking about mean square error. Um, so that's the variance plus the bias squared. And um, you know, we call that error right away. So variance is associated with error. So from the statistical perspective, we just definitely want to, to minimize variance. OK, so the question I want to ask today then in the context of this talk is, are there situations in which more variability is helpful? Are there situations, and particularly situations in statistical estimation, where we're happy when we see more variability in our data? Okay, So that's what we're going to explore. And we'll explore that specifically um, in the context of species tree estimation. And I'll specifically look at um, four cases where more variation in the observed data leads to better statistical inference. OK, so to do that, I'm going to just spend a minute introducing the multi-species coalescent, which is the model that underlies most of the work that I've been doing for the last at least 10 years, um, and talk about um, data generation processes under the multi-species coalescent model. So, um, so this is a species tree. Um, and what I've depicted here are only three tips in the tree. And we're going to stick with um, three tip species trees throughout the talk. So we're going to keep it nice and simple and just get, try to get some ideas across. Um, this is the present time. And this is back in time. And we view um, this population here as the ancestral species. This is a speciation event where this species on the left becomes distinct from the ancestor to these two species on the right. This is another speciation event where now we have two distinct species that continue to evolve independently. So that's the model that we're going to work with. What we often are interested in is how do we estimate the species tree? So how do we decide that these two species are the most closely related and this is a more distant relative? We also might care about the branch lengths within the species phylogeny. So we also might care about what's the, what length of time has passed between these two speciation events. Okay, so those are the problems that, that we'll think about. OK, um, this is a species tree. We also need to have the concept of a gene tree. So we want to um, understand not just the evolutionary history of the species, how the species are related, but the evolutionary history of in, um, individual um, genes within the genome. And those individual gene histories can differ from the overall species level phylogeny. So I'm going to next show an animation of a gene tree evolving within the species tree. Um, in that animation, there'll be a gene copy sampled in this species, a gene copy in this species, and a gene copy in this species. And we're going to trace the relationships of those gene copies back in time. OK, so let me go ahead and play that, and we can talk about what's happening. And I'll let you watch it through once or twice here. OK, so we've got these gene copies that are um, sort of we're following their history back in time. And at some point along the phylogenetic tree, these two gene copies share a common ancestor. And that happens right here. And then the common ancestor of all three gene copies is further back in time here. Okay? And we can see that this gene tree looks exactly like the species tree. So we have a match between the gene tree and the species tree. Um, and that seems like a sensible thing. But that's not the only possibility. So this is a different animation now. And in this animation, we have the same process where we're tracing the evolutionary history of these gene copies as they go back in time. Um, through, through the tree. But when we get to this common ancestral population here, these two gene copies do not share a common ancestor. Rather, they continue to be distinct 
um, copies of the gene in that ancestral population. And that continues all the way back to this ancestral population of all three, where we see that the common ancestor is actually between this species and this species. So for this particular gene, the gene tree is different from the species tree. And so we have variation. So connecting this now to what, where I started, we have variation in the individual gene histories that we can observe in the context of this multi-species coalescent model. Okay, so what we're going to think about today then is this variation that's induced by this particular model and what that means for statistical estimation. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is um, stick with this species tree, okay, throughout the talk um, to help us keep track of, of what the tips are, what the species are. We have these nice pretty birds. Um, and so in our species tree that we'll use throughout the talk, the blue bird and the green bird are most closely related and the orange bird is a more distant relative. Um, we're gonna be interested also in the length of time between the two speciation events. And so for this first tree that I'm going to show you, we'll assume that that length of time is 0.5. Um, that's in coalescent units, although that's not gonna be important for the talk because we're just gonna vary that length of time by doubling it so the units won't be so important. Rather, it will be important what happens when we increase that length of time. But for those who wanna keep track of these things, it's 0.5 coalescent units. Okay, so, so this will be our model. Um, and the first thing that I wanna think about is what is the distribution of the gene trees that come from the species tree. So we saw in the animations that there were at least two different gene trees you could get. There's actually three. There's one more possibility, and that's that the one all the way on the left and the one all the way on the right are the first to share a common ancestor. So there's actually three possibilities, and we want to look at the relative probabilities of those. So I've depicted those probabilities with the bar chart here. Um, and so this first um, bar, is the probability, the height of the bar corresponds to the probability that the gene tree is the same as the species tree. So this first bar has the blue and the green birds grouped together as um, the being most related. And the height of that bar is about, I think it's about 0.6 here, okay? So that means that when we have this species tree and when the, the length of that branch between speciation events is 0.5, about 60% of our genes are gonna have the same topology, the same relationship as the species tree, okay? That means the other 40% are gonna have the other two relationships. And there's a symmetry here um, so that we have the same probability of those other two trees, so about 20% probability of those other two trees. And you can see those here. The other two possibilities are that the orange and green birds are most closely related or that the orange and blue birds are most closely related. And so these bars um, depict the probability distribution. Um, another way to look at that would be as a pie chart, which is a nice simple visualization for those who'd like to see the distribution a different way. And we can kind of see, um, kind of quickly assess how much variation there is in our gene tree distribution. Okay, okay so hopefully that looks good to everybody. We're now going to um, look at a different, a, a similar species tree, but we're gonna double the length of that internal branch. Okay, and we want to see what effect doubling the length of that internal branch has on the gene tree distribution. Okay, and it turns out that when we do that, this probability of the gene tree matching the species tree increases. It comes up to about 75%. And that's pretty intuitive because what happens here is there's more time for that common ancestor event to occur. And it therefore increases the probability that it does occur. Okay, and it increases it to about 75%. That means that the probabilities of these other two gene trees have to be lower, okay, since the whole thing has to add up to one. And we can you know, look at it either in the bar chart form or in pie chart form. Okay. Now I'm gonna double the length again, and you probably all have a guess about what's gonna happen. Now hopefully if you're still awake and still following me, so let's just look at that quickly. So now that length is two. Um, and indeed, the probability of the gene tree matching the species tree increases again, and that's now about 90%, and we have about 10% um, probability of the other two trees. And here I really like the pie chart because you can really see that now there's less variance in what we might expect to see, right? Because now most of the gene trees, most of the time that I you know, sample a gene, its history is gonna match the species tree. So I claim that as we move down the screen, here on the right, right side, um, 
we have less variability in the probability distribution because most of the gene trees match the species tree. So when I go into the lab and I get data for a gene, it's fairly likely that it's going to match the species tree. I'm not expecting very much variance there. Whereas at the top of the screen, um, I might you know, be less sure if I get one gene tree, whether it's one that matches the species tree or not. So this is a more variable distribution. So if my goal is to estimate the species tree, I actually prefer the data scenario that has um, less variance, right? If my goal is to estimate the species tree, I'd really like to be in this bottom scenario because I only need a couple of genes to become fairly convinced of what the species tree is. So we're not gonna talk about that problem because my, my goal is to show you that sometimes we want more variance instead of less. So instead we're gonna talk about the problem of estimating the branch length. And, and hopefully you can see that, that there's information in the probability distribution about the branch length. If there's a lot of variation in the gene trees, the branch is short. And if there's not a lot of variation in the gene trees, the branch is long. And it turns out that's a direct relationship. So if we could observe that gene tree probability distribution directly, we would know the branch length. Okay, so that's a direct relationship. So we're gonna think about it in an estimation context. So this is the model. So going from left to right, that's the model. We'll now flip it around. We'll suppose that we have some data and we want to do the estimation problem. We wanna figure out what that internal length is. Okay, so the, the theoretical probability of gene trees matching the species tree is about 60% here. Let's suppose that we do a large scale genomic study and we find that 62% of our data gene trees um, are of this type. What would the estimate of the branch length be? So there's a formula for this, a nice simple formula, but we're not gonna do math today, it's too early for that. Um, so I've already done it and I can tell you that the estimate of the branch length would be 0.562, okay? Um, so we get the estimate and, you know, that seems close to what we were looking at before from the model, so it seems like a reasonable estimate. I'm interested in the variance of the estimate, okay? So um, when you, you've, you've probably um, seen this idea before of the variance of an estimator, it's what you use when you form confidence intervals. You would add and subtract two times the standard error, so we're looking at that variance, that error term. Um, and you can compute here exactly the variance of this. So the variance of this estimator, how far is, we can expect it to be from the true value, is about 0 0.0163. So let's compare that to what happens in a case where 71% of the gene trees look that way. Okay, then our estimator of the length is 0.832. Our estimator of the variance of the estimate is 0 0.025. And one final case, suppose we got 93% of that dominant tree then our estimate of the um, length is 2.254, variance 0.1392. Okay, so the precise numbers aren't important, but what I want you to notice here is that when I had a more variable data set, I had lower variance in the estimate. And when I had a less variable data set, I had much higher variance in the estimate. So if I care about getting a precise estimate of that internal length, it's actually better to have more variation in the data I collect, okay? So this is a case where seeing more variation in the data gives me better estimation. Seeing less variation in the data does not give me as precise an estimate. So it's kind of, at least to me, a little bit counterintuitive that there are cases where it's like, yay, all my gene trees are different, right? This is generally not what we're excited about. We just sort of want them to all be the same so that we can you know, cleanly tell the story. But if we care about those lengths, we're like, oh great, I have a lot of variation in my gene trees. I'm gonna be able to say something about times, about evolutionary times. So kind of an interesting um, scenario, and at least for me, counterintuitive. Okay, so that was case one, that was example one. What happens now when we actually have sequence data? Because as most of you know, you don't walk into the lab and walk out with gene trees. You walk into the lab and you walk out with sequence data and then you have to estimate gene trees. So we don't quite get to observe these gene tree distributions directly. So what happens when we throw sequence data on top of this? Okay, so, oh, sorry, I wanted to summarize this before I moved on to the next problem. Okay, so, so quick summary of what I was just talking about. Um, so as the, so this blue line is um, a measure of, um, what I'm using as a proxy for how much variability the distribution has. So this is the proportion of non-matching gene trees, the proportion of gene trees that don't match the species tree. And when 
when there's not a lot of matching, so in a high variability setting, the variance of the estimate is low. So this orange line is the variance of the estimate. And in a um, low variability setting, the variance of the estimate is high. And as we go throughout the talk, I want to have um, just sort of a picture to help us remember that result. Um, and so that picture will be this. So when gene tree variance is high, variance in the estimated length is low. When gene tree variance is low, variance in the estimated length is high. So I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures like this to help keep things together. OK, now we're going to move on to sequence data. So what happens for DNA sequence data? So first thing is we've got to go back to the multi-species coalescent, and we've got to understand the model. OK, so we have the same start. We have a species tree and a gene tree that evolves inside the species tree. Now once we have that gene tree, we have DNA sequence data evolve along that gene tree. Um, and so this animation is showing that process. At the root of the tree, we pick one of the four nucleotides at random in proportion to the frequency of those nucleotides um, in, the, in the population. Um, and then that nucleotide sort of evolves down the tree. In this particular animation, there's no mutation. And so the observation at the tips of the tree is that all three of the species have nucleotide G at this particular locus. Okay, so my observation here would be a column in the alignment for which I have G, G, G. But then, of course, that's not the only thing that can happen. I can also have mutation along the tree. So in this animation, there's a mutation event. A G mutates to an A along that branch, and I get an observation of A, G, G at the tips of the tree. Okay? Um, and so that's another example of a possible site pattern that I can observe um, at a column in my alignment. Okay, so hopefully you can imagine how the data are generated then under this model. And there are, of course, many possibilities. I'm only showing you two of those. Um, as we did in the last case, we want to summarize the data by looking at its probability distribution so that we can look at the effect of variability. So we're again going to start with this same species tree. We're going to have the blue and the green um, birds most closely related and the orange more distantly related. We're going to start with an internal length of 0.5. And we're going to look at the frequency of the different site patterns. And I've summarized those really compactly into five categories. Um, the first category here you'll see is XXX. And that represents all of the constant site patterns. So it represents GGG, which is the one I showed in the animation, but also AAA, CCC, TTT. So all of those are grouped in that category. And the height of that bar is the probability of getting one of those four. Okay. The next column here, yxx, would correspond to the second um, example I showed you in the animation, an agg. So the first thing is different than the other two. And of course, there are many of those as well. Okay. So you can compute this site pattern probability distribution exactly. So this number, 0.9754, is actually the, the expected proportion of constant site patterns in your data. I think this is actually a little bit shocking all by itself, maybe. Um, Maybe those of you who work with um, multi-locus sequence data probably are, are less surprised if you haven't actually sat down and looked at this. Maybe this is a bit surprising that a large proportion of your data are constant site patterns. Um, there's not so much variation, um, variable sites in your data set, even if you collect very large scale um, genomic data, a small portion of that is actually variable. Um, so I think that's sort of surprising um, right off the bat. Um, let's see what happens then as we lengthen the branch, okay, the internal branch. Um, then that proportion of constant site patterns decreases a little bit, so from 0.9754 to 0.9729. And if we do it again, double the length of the branch, it decreases even more, um, 0.9681. Okay. So again, this is our, our generating model, so this is a model. We have these species tree, which, trees which give rise to these probability distributions. Um, and now it's sort of the reverse. As I move down the screen, I have sort of more variation. And what I mean by that is fewer of the sites have the constant pattern. So there's more probability associated with these other site patterns. It's a little bit hard to tell because there's still so many constant sites. But you do have a little bit more probability assigned to the other site patterns, and notably this, this one. Um, looks a little bit bigger, and you would expect that because you have that long branch off to the left, so there's time for mutation to start accumulating as the tree is lengthened. Um, so, so here, this is the least variable distribution. This is the most variable distribution. Okay, so what we want to do again is 
is now do the estimation problem. So this is the model part. We want to do the estimation part. So we want to get some data about the proportion of site patterns, and we want to estimate that internal branch length from the data. Okay. Okay, so in this case, we can compute the estimator exactly of the branch length, but it's um, harder to estimate the variance, um, harder to get the estimate of the variability of the estimator. So to deal with that, I did a simulation. I just repeated the estimation many, many times, and I look at the variance of the estimators. So these are coming from simulation, but we can interpret it um, pretty much the same way that we did the last time. So what do we get here? Our estimator is on average about 0.537. Um, pretty, pretty close to the true value of 0.5, and our variance 0 0.000153. Okay, that number isn't too meaningful by itself to us right now, but let's compare it to what happens when we simulate from a tree with a longer internal branch length, an internal branch length of one. We get a very nice estimate, 0 0.9890, and our variability is a bit smaller. Okay, and let's do one more. We get an estimate 1.9333, and our variance is even a bit smaller. Okay, so again, we have this pattern that as variance in the data increases, variance in the estimator decreases. Okay, so more variable data lead to better estimation of the parameter that we care about. So again, to me, this counterintuitive um, kind of setting where it's like, yay, there's a lot of variation in the data. This one's probably not as counterintuitive from bio for biologists because we actually like when we see a very variable site patterns. So this sort of makes sense that variable site patterns are going to give us information about branch lengths. But um, from a purely statistical perspective or from a like what might you want perspective, it's like, oh good, my data is really confusing. That means I'm going to be able to estimate this parameter well. right? So maybe a little bit um, unintuitive. OK, so let's summarize this one as well. Um, so here I'm using as a proxy of variability the proportion of non-constant sites. Um, so when that um, proportion is high, my data are more variable and the variance of the estimate is lower. When the proportion of non-constant sites is lower, um, the data are, more, are less variable, um, and the variance of the estimate is higher. Okay? So again, we have this sort of nice graphical summary of this, where when I have high site pattern variance, I have lower variance in the estimated length, and when I have lower site pattern variance, I have higher variance in the estimated length. OK, so two examples down. Um, we're going to now make it one more, add one more level of complexity, and that is let's think about what happens when we add selection. So this is a common question that I am asked when I'm um, talking about the multi-species coalescent is what happens if some of your loci are under selection? How is that going to impact the type of inference that you can make? Um, and so I think that's a really interesting question to think about. Um, and you know, we can think about the effects of selection on both the topology, um, estimate and on the branch length estimates. Um, so I'm going to stick with these examples, but sort of redo the first two examples, but add this component of selection to these first two examples. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to use for this is some recent work um, with a graduate student from OSU, Matt Washer, where he derived an approximation to the rate of coalescence under selection um, that would that could be, was in a convenient format um, to allow us to study the effect of selection on species tree inference. Okay, so this is the only equation in the talk, and it's not super important that you look too carefully at it, but I want to give you a flavor of what this approximation involved so that you can, um, hopefully I can convince you that this is sort of sensible. So, so what Matt did was um, try to get uh, a value for the rate of coalescence that occurs in the presence of selection. So without selection, the rate of coalescence is m choose 2, where m is the number of lineages in the sample. And so the question was, when there's selection, how does this rate change? What's the effect on, on the rate? So um, uh, Matt really is a, was a graduate student in statistics who really likes to think about mathematics and, and large sample approximations. I think he had a lot of fun with this. And what he came up with was, was this expression, which depends on the number of lineages in the sample, but also depends, and it's derived from the right Fisher model, so we're thinking of proportion of capital A alleles and proportion of little a alleles. Um, so it will depend on the proportion of a alleles in the current generation and also the probability distribution of the number of capital A alleles, um, and that 
probability distribution comes up here. If you're looking at this formula quickly, you're probably thinking she's talking about selection and there's no selection in this expression that I've written. So like, where did the selection go? It appears in the probability distribution for H. Okay, so it's sort of in embedded here. Um, it's a little bit hidden here. Um, but what's nice about this is that this is pretty simple to um, evaluate for any particular value of S and any particular mutation rate. It's hard to evaluate in general, like it's sort of hard to solve for it because you've got to compute this probability distribution that's hard to deal with. But if you specify everything, if you specify the selection coefficient and you specify a mutation rate, you can just compute this. So what I'm going to do in the talk, well, let me tell you a little bit more about it first. Okay, so the take home was, and, and Matt was very disappointed, it doesn't really change the rate of coalescence very much. So in all of the realistic scenarios, the rate of coalescence is like a little bit higher, but not importantly higher. So he was pretty disappointed. He's like, this is, you know, I just did all this math and <laughs> it doesn't matter. I think this, I kept telling him, this is great because we'll all be happy to know that we don't have to worry too much about selection. Like we're really delighted that it doesn't matter very much. Um, I don't know if I've convinced him yet, but you know, I keep trying and we're, the paper's under review. So. Um, but the takeaway is that in most situations, it, it's not, um, not, it doesn't change the rate of coalescence very much. The greatest increases are on the order of 10 to 15%. And those tend to happen in scenarios that aren't incredibly biologically realistic. So, um, so to get those big increases, you're probably in a scenario that happens rarely, if at all. Um, how much it changes depends on the strength of selection and the frequency of mutation. Okay, those are parameters in the model. Um, but what we're going to do today is look at how, the, how does this affect estimation of branch lengths from gene trees and from sequence data. So we'll re redo the first two parts of the talk, but now in the presence of selection. And I picked a worst case scenario so we could try to maximize the, the difference that we'd see. Okay, so let's start now with the gene tree variation problem. So we'll look at gene tree variation under the multi-species coalescent with selection. Start with our same tree where we have the two, um, the, the blue and green bird most closely related, an internal length of 0.5. Okay, and so what I'm showing here is the distribution we looked at before for the gene trees without selection. Those are the purple bars. And I've added on the um, probability distribution with selection in the red bars. So the effect here is that we get a bit more of the, the gene tree that matches the species tree in the presence of selection, okay? Um, that happens because the rate of coalescence is accelerated, and so there are more coalescences that happen in that ancestral interval right here, and we get a bit more of the gene tree that matches the species tree, okay? That means that the other two need to go down a little bit, okay? And that pattern carries on through all of the scenarios, okay? So you can see in all the cases, the red bar for the gene tree matching the species tree is just a bit higher than the purple bar and the other two are lower, okay? Okay, again, that's our data generation model, okay? Um, we now want to do the inference problem. So we want to, to know when we collect data, what effect does that have on inferring the branch length? Again, if we cared about inferring the topology, selection is good news for us, right? Because if we care about the topology, even more of the gene trees are gonna match the species tree. So the topology estimation problem gets easier, but we're gonna look here at the, at the branch length problem. Okay, so we wanna do this direction. Okay, and I'm gonna be a little bit lazy here. Instead of putting a bunch of numbers up there, I'm gonna just describe the trend. So this is the trend that we had before, the proportion of non-matching gene trees as that proportion decreased. So as variability decreased, the variance in the estimate increased. Okay, we can think about what's gonna happen here the proportion of non-matching gene trees decreases in the presence of selection because more of the gene trees match the species tree. And that means that the uh, variance of the estimate will increase a little bit. So these two lines just sort of slide. The blue one slides down, the orange one slides up, but the relationships stay, okay? The relationships don't change. So my summary for this one is gonna be the same picture we had before, high gene tree variance, is lower variance in the estimated length, lower gene tree variance is higher variance in the estimated length, but I'm gonna add the selection component here. When there's higher selection, we get lower gene tree variance, and therefore higher variance in the estimated length. When there's lower selection, we get higher gene tree variance, lower variance in the estimated length, okay? So that's what happens in the case of gene trees. Our last case then is what happens for site pattern probabilities. 
So again, start with the same species tree. The same exact thing happens with site pattern probabilities. We get a bit more of the matching pattern. So the effect of selection is to reduce the variability in the data distribution, but only a little bit. Okay. So I think we've probably got the idea, so I put them all up here so we don't have to go through the cases one by one. The red bar is a little bit higher than the purple bar in all of the cases. This is our data generation model. So when we want to now do the estimation problem, okay, we want to go backwards. We observe some data on site pattern probabilities. We want to estimate the branch lengths. Um, we'll again just go right to the, um, the sort of trend and see what's going on. So the proportion, our previous, so ignoring the arrows for a minute, our previous result was that the proportion of non-constant sites when that was high, okay, so that was high variability in the data, there was low variance of the estimate, low variability in the data with high variance of the estimate. The proportion of non-constant sites um, will increase here, and that means that the variance of the estimate will decrease. So again, we have these lines that slide, but the relationship doesn't change. Okay, so our summary then is that when there's, before we had, when there's high site pattern variance, there's low variance in the estimated length. Um, low site pattern variance was high variance in the estimated length, and selection acts to decrease the uh, variation in the data. So when there's more selection, there's uh, lower variance in the data. When there's high selection, there's more variance in the data. Okay. So to recap this part of things, um, our first scenario looked at the relationship between G-tree variance and variance in the estimated length, and we saw that more gene-tree variation led to better estimation of the internal length of the species tree. So more variability in our data lets us get a more precise estimate of the length of that branch. We saw that that pattern held for site pattern variation, so more site pattern variation led to more precise estimation of the speciation time. And then we looked at the effect of selection, and that didn't disrupt the previous patterns that we had, but the effect of selection was to decrease very slightly the amount of variance in the data that we would expect. Okay? So sort of some good news here in that selection doesn't change things very much. It does have this slight effect of decreasing variability in the data. Okay, so those are the, those are the four examples. Um, and so I just want to take the last few minutes and talk about um, variability in a different way. So the title of my talk was Embracing Variability. And I, I want to tell a little story before, so this is sort of story time of the talk. Uh, I want to tell a little story that I meant to say at the beginning because I went to a session yesterday, a wonderful session yesterday on hybridization um, where I saw a talk, and I'm going to mention, I don't know if he's here, I don't, someone I don't know, but a talk by Josh Johnner from the University of Wyoming. And the title of that talk was Baseline Expectations for the High Variability of Outcomes in Replicate Hybrid Zones. And the point of the talk was that um, when we only collect one sample, we sort of look at it and make a lot of inference. But if we don't have well calibrated how much variability we would expect in that sample, we might really go down a road that represents sort of stochastic variability in the outcome rather than, um, than the, the true biological scenario. And so the talk was about sort of trying to predict how much variability you would expect when you sampled in a hybrid zone. And the finding was that there could be quite a lot, and there could be many different stories. Um, and he had a slide at the end, again, I'm going to cheat and read it exactly, but he had a slide at the end that said, embracing variability in mapping pattern to process that was a call to statisticians to use this wonderful variation that he was observing to come up with better estimators. So it was the perfect lead-in for this talk. And it highlighted to me something that I love about this community, and that is the variance of all of us, the variance in our approaches to science and in our backgrounds and in where we come from. And so, ah, okay, so I wanted to, I need to go back. Okay, so, um, so I was talking to Sydney as she was working on the illustrations, and I was like, I want some picture that sort of summarizes statistical variability, but also the biological variability of what everybody studies. And she came up with this, this diagram, which I think is beautiful. It's a histogram that shows variance, and it also shows a whole variety of um, study organisms right on the histogram, and I think it might be my favorite figure of all time. But um, one reason I've always been drawn to this community was because of this feature, because all of you are studying really different things. Um, I'm a statistician. I don't have a particular study organism. Um, I like to work with different people who are studying different things. Um, 
And it's, it's been a wonderful community for me to be involved in. It's sometimes also scary. So I looked back um, on my history, and the first evolution meeting I came to was in 2008. And I think I felt a little bit like this picture. I felt like the statistician sort of out there, like trying to get involved in this biological community. And people who know me now say, you know, you have this appointment in a biology department. You have a bachelor's degree in biology. You can't claim you don't know any biology. So I'm going to tell you one quick story with the goal of waking you up and also convincing you I was right to worry. OK, so, so I do have a bachelor's degree in biology. And I think it was my sophomore year. I was taking an invertebrate zoology class, and we took a a field trip to Duke University where we were going to do some sort of marine biology. And the first thing that happened was our instructor, who we all thought was the greatest, coolest person ever, turned us loose on the beach and said, go find interesting stuff. If you find anything re really cool, bring it back and, and show it to me. So I was like, awesome. This is great. I love exploring. I'm going to find something cool. So I walk around and I find this um, small orange thing. It's pretty porous. I'm like, this is cool. And I'm, I'm from rural Ohio. Like, it's like a sponge or some coral or something. I'm like, I'm going to go show this to the instructor. I showed a couple of the other students. They're like, oh, I don't know what that is. You should go show them. So I took it to him, you know, cool, it, cool instructor. And he said two words that I remember more than 30 years later. And those words were, that's styrofoam. <laughs> so, so my cool organism was styrofoam. It was man-made. It was on the beach. And I, I, so I think there's, there's some basis for me feeling a bit outside this distribution, right? I mean, hopefully I've come a long way since then. But you know, sometimes you feel like you're, you know, it's, it's just you're scared, right? Um, this community has been great. And this animation sort of shows me taking my statistics and really trying to embrace with this community. And I think that everybody has really been welcoming. And you know, now I love this meeting. It's my favorite meeting. I love this community. Um, and so I'm quite um, comfortable and happy here. And so I just want to remind this community of the value, I hope, of embracing everybody from different backgrounds and um, different environments and recognizing that it's hard for people to engage with us sometimes. I love this animation, but what would be really nice is if the walk wasn't so long. So I want to encourage all of you to, um, to continue to welcome everybody and reach out. I hope that I always do that, because that's what this community did for me. So, so thank you for that. Um, with that, I want to thank um, students and postdocs. These are the graduate students and postdocs that I've been fortunate to mentor um, during my career. Um, they're all wonderful people, and I've learned a ton about statistics, biology, and the world from them. Um, and I'm grateful for all of them. I've also mentored um, some master's students and a whole bunch of undergraduates through REU programs. Too many pictures to put up here, but I've really enjoyed working with everybody. Um, and finally, I want to thank the Society of Systematic Biologists. Um, as Brian mentioned, I was elected as president in 2019. I thought I knew what I was getting into. Um, I started the role on January 1st of 2020. And I have to say, I never envisioned a global pandemic meeting cancellations. Um, None of it was what I envisioned. Um, but throughout it all, I was very, very fortunate to interact with the leadership of systematic biology and all of the members. And I, I have to say that the, the, the people involved in SSB taught me a lot about um, acting with grace and compassion in a scientific setting when faced with a lot of um, unjust things happening in the world. And I'll take those lessons with me forever. So thank you to the society for the opportunity to serve. Thank you to all of you for coming today. I think I've probably talked very fast, and there's time for questions. So with that, I'll stop, stop talking and ask if any of you have any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, so that's a great question. The question, so I'll repeat it in case um, not everybody could hear, was whether we've looked at any other kinds of selection, like balancing selection. And we haven't, really. Um, so I think that's interesting. It's, it's a little bit hard to get a lot of enthusiasm for doing a lot of tough mathematics when the guess is probably that it's not going to matter too much. But, um, but we haven't. So I think that's definitely an interesting thing to think about. Yep. OK. OK, yeah, that's great. That, that's great to know that. See, this is one of the examples where it's good for the statistician to talk to the biologist who says the balancing selection might do the trick. So yeah, so great. Thank you. Yep. 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, the, the curved lines crossing, those are exact calculations. So I can actually you know, get an exact expression. I'm not simulating, I'm not approximating. So that's the true relationship. The straight lines um, come from simulation, and I'm not sure they're entirely straight. So the blue one is straight. That I have a formula for. That's a straight line. The um, variance line, the orange line, um, I've drawn that straight. From the simulations, it's almost straight. <laughs> so that's sort of a cartoony version. I don't have the exact expression for that. I think I can get it. So, um, so stay tuned. I think I'll try to figure out what exactly that is. But that's more of a cartoon in that case. Um, as for why, I think it um, largely has to do with you know, the first model just has one exponential term that governs the gene tree species tree relationship. And so we're going to expect this curve relationship since we're dealing with these exponential functions. Um, in the other case, we have the site pattern, the substitution model layered on top of that. This was the jukes canner uh, model. And so somehow the, the, both the coalescent and the jukes canner model leads to an expectation that in terms of the proportion of constant site patterns that is linear rather than curved. And I don't, I haven't thought hard about why that should be the case. So, so that's a partial answer. Yep. Yeah, I think there should be a leveling off, right? The way we can have saturation with just a gene tree and a single locus problem, we can get to saturation. That should happen here, too. The other thing that I'm not telling you here, um, is it's a really good point to bring up, is there's a bunch of parameters I said and assumed here. And probably the most important was one was I made an assumption about the effective population size. I held that constant across the tree, and it's constant across all the simulations. If you change the effective population size, you're essentially changing the mutation rate, and that's going to lead to a whole other set of relationships. So in actuality, it's probably a bit more complex than this. Um, I do think the trends hold here. So if I had separate effective population sizes on all the branches and they're, not, they're, they're sort of realistic, I still think you're going to prefer, prefer more variability when you estimate that internal branch length. But um, if you wanted to estimate the tree, things can be different, and, and you might not have that nice curve relationship in that case. So it's a really good point that there are a bunch of other things that go in here, and I'm mostly just assuming one value for those and then holding that constant across the whole simulation. Yeah, so it's a really good point. I'm blinded by the light here for a second. Any other any other questions? All right, Louise. <laughs> Good. I'm relieved to know that. Right, I wasn't so far off because, you know, like I said, this is, this is a fairly traumatic. Like, do I need to rethink my life? You know, kind of experience where you're like, oh my gosh, it's not even alive. <laughs> So, so thank you. <laughs> Anything else? All right, great. Well, thank you again very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, and thanks for coming today.